Hello and welcome. You are listening to The Day My Brain Broke, presented by me, Lucy Reddin, in partnership with the Encephalitis Society. We shall be sharing with you the lives and experiences of those affected by encephalitis, a type of brain inflammation. Hello and welcome to the Day My Brain Broke podcast and today we're going to be speaking with Maria and Maria is one of our wonderful volunteers over in Northern Ireland. So Maria, welcome, lovely to speak Thank with you. you today. Thank yes, you, yes, nice to be here. Well, I'm looking forward to getting, the, getting on with this, like I said to you earlier, it'd be just nice to explain my side of what happened and how things have changed over the years because wonderful. it has been a number of years now. Yes, well, I can't wait to hear. So let's let's just dive straight in and go ahead. Okay. So Maria, could you please just explain to me and to the audience what life was like before you had encephalitis? Right. At the time before encephalitis, I was running a restaurant with my husband. My husband's the chef and I would do what we call front of house. Um, we live in a small community and we had a, well, I have two children. And at that point, they were both in primary school. One was age seven and one was age eight. And we lived in a kind of a semi-rural setting where the no public transport as such. And we lived about four miles outside the town. So we obviously had to drive everywhere to get to somewhere. Um, there was a school bus for the children, but they were quite young. So we kind of worked around that. And um, day to day, that was just, it was work and then time with the kids really, keeping them occupied and doing homework with them and the same routine as everybody else really at that point. Mm -hmm. I can imagine working at a restaurant must have been quite intensive, like hour, long hours and long work. Shift. Well, I suppose I've been doing it for so long, we were used to it and the children grew up with it as well. And at that time, I worked most, well, five evenings a week and I had a team of what I call it made me schoolgirls that I knew, but they were my team of babysitters because I didn't just rely on one person because obviously um, I was out most nights, so I couldn't just rely on one and the kids had several. So they were all very supportive. So I had a team of babysitters along with my staff here at the restaurant, which was quite minimal because we do a lot of it ourselves. Yeah, brilliant. OK, yeah. so then a lot of us in the run up to having, you know, ending up in hospital with, with encephalitis, we kind of have a bit of a buildup of our symptoms. So whether there is, yeah. you know, a few days, a few weeks and what have you, a few months maybe for others. What was it like for you? Well, my, my incident happened at the beginning of December. And what I recall at the yeah, beginning- Sorry to interrupt, Maria, what, what year were we talking here? In two, 2007. 207, okay. 207, my incident happened, and um, I'm usually fairly healthy. Instead, I was at a gym and I was quite active. Um, I did a lot of swimming with the kids and things like that there. And one day, then I woke up and I was starting to get this headache. Now, I'm not prone to headaches, it's not something that I would ever really kind of suffer with. So, um, again, I thought, well, as they say, I was doing what I thought I should be doing. And you carried on with work and everything. And um, I'd actually remember the date quite well because um, later on that week, I'd actually booked a night off work. I was going to take the children to Santa to see their visit to Santa for Christmas. Wonderful. Yeah. And it all happened then um, as that day was progressing, getting nearer. And um, the headache started at the beginning of the week, which was on the Monday, Tuesday. Come the Wednesday, I was taking the kids to see Santa. And I was in a conversation with somebody out in a, a little kind of an office. And all of a sudden I got very nausea and very lightheaded and I thought this isn't right, this isn't the way I normally feel. Mm -hmm. um, the headaches were still there and I was getting just a slight kind of a stiffness and awkwardness on the back of my neck and on the right of my neck. Now, I, like I said, I had taken planned to take the children away that evening to do a visit to Santa, but I just wasn't feeling comfortable the way I was, um, and it was a drive, it was quite a drive away. Right. Yeah. So I just said to my husband, I'm gonna go and see the doctor, something's not feeling right about this here. I was quite fortunate when I explained what was going on, how I was feeling. Um, I got an appointment that, that day quite quickly. And um, again, I live in a small rural community and I didn't know the doctor personally, but I knew him through the restaurant serving him and everything. And he knew me as, as a history. He knew something wasn't right from the way he knew me before to the way I was acting when I went in to see him. Right. So at that point, um, before it went any further, he just said to me, Marie, I'm sending you in. Oh, wow. So it was that quickly. So. Um, at that point then, um, I remember just saying to him, can I not leave it until tomorrow? Because I was taking the kids to see Santa, yeah. but he said no. Yeah. So anyway, my husband was busy with work and we haven't got a family network around us. We've got no family members where we are, it's just ourselves. And then like I say, but in staff and things. So 
Um, I didn't want to bother my husband because he was getting ready for service for work. So um, the doctor kind of arranged to get an ambulance to take me to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize what was going on at this point. I thought it was just going in just to get something looked at and whatever. But in no time at all, before I even got to the ambulance or got to the hospital, um, again, somebody knew me as I arrived at the hospital and they acknowledged me, but I didn't know who they were. And I wasn't aware of what was going on around me. Right. So quite that quickly, was the start of it. Yeah, yeah, that, it, yeah it went, it seemed to kind of just all of a sudden come on quite quickly. Yeah. And so. That was on the 3rd of December that right. happened. And then um, I was in for a couple of days and then they started doing all the usual tests. They did a, um, they did a CAT scan and they did a CT scan and a lumbar puncture. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't showing anything too, too radical that they couldn't, they still couldn't work out what was going on. And I think from what I was reading um, through some records that they gave me, they initially thought it was going to be meningitis. Mm. So that's where they were thinking on. And as the time when the hospital progressed then, and they were looking at me, apparently I was quite alert at the beginning, but then I, I was losing that during the few days I was in there. Yeah. And I started to get a lot of shakes and I couldn't control them. And then the headaches were getting worse and I couldn't, if, and if I bent down and moved my head, it was aggravated the headache even more. Mm. And the shakes and I was getting hot, and I was getting cold all the time and everything. So they knew something else wasn't going on. So at this point, then a few days later, one of the consultants from another hospital came up to the dairy. And when he saw what was going on, then he started looking into it at another level. And he put me on Cyclovir and he had um, my brain fluid yep. so that was I went into hospital on the Wednesday and it was that following Wednesday that he actually started me on the treatment right for the, right. Uh, for the um although he wasn't sure it was encephalitis he kind of just felt then the, the other symptoms that he was reading through and the way that I was behaving he thought yeah. it was a possibility yeah. and I think by getting that done then um it did make a big implication of the way I was going to come out really you realize it afterwards um, my family didn't know what was going on. Um, they obviously knew at this point, like I said, I had no immediate family in the area. My mother lives about a seven hour drive away from me here and my sister lives in the United Kingdom. Right. So both of them, when they found out something was going on, they both arrived over to help Stanley with the children and just oh, to be around to give support. Yeah. And um, again, they didn't know what was going on, but they, they knew something wasn't right. So um, my weakness, I, I got quite weak as well. And they wanted to move me to the other hospital in Belfast, which is about an hour from where I am. Okay. Um, but they had to wait till they could kind of get me more, more stabilised before they could move me to the, what they call the Royal in Belfast, where they wanted to do more observation and more, more, more checking about me. So about a week or so later, they got me into the, to the Royal in Belfast. And at that point, then I was a zombie. I've got no recollection of very much at all. Anything I remember more so now is what my family have told me. Yeah, yeah. Um, or what's been kind of triggered again to tell me things. Um, my memory was very, very poor. Um, I didn't recognise the doctor. I didn't recognise the doctor that kept coming in to see me. I didn't know who he was every time he came in. Yeah. Um, again, I couldn't relate to nurses or who was around me. And what really startled at the very beginning when they found this was a problem was I came out one afternoon from a sleep or whatever and there was a lady standing in the corner beside me. And I had to ask the nurse, who's that lady over there? She keeps looking at me. And it turned out to be my own mother. At this point, they realized then, and then when they brought my children in to see me, um, they actually brought photographs of the children in first so that I would be able to identify them. Wow. And I guess that so was quite frightening. Next them as well, because they don't want your children to overhear you saying. Yeah. Yeah. You know, well, who, yeah. yeah. So um, it was quite daunting. I think one. I suppose I was still like in my own world that I didn't really kind of know what was going on in a big way. But for those family members around me, seeing what was happening to me and what I was going through, um, they were really hurting and they were really, really worried. Yeah. yeah. So and because their hands, I mean, they didn't know the outcome. Like my husband said, there was so when they were told it was encephalitis. Mm -hmm. Again, they didn't know what it was. And then, as they said, there were so many strands of encephalitis that it affects so many people yeah. in so many different ways that there was no one singular outcome. So they were just really waiting to see how things were going to progress and what was going to be the outcome. But um, my memory was very, very poor and my appetite wasn't there. And I had no energy level to do anything, to get up out of the bed, to get dressed, I couldn't do. I had to have assistance to use the facilities to get to anywhere. Um, washing and dressing just didn't happen. I just lay in the bed without changing at all. Somebody helped me. And then um, over time, 
and I couldn't watch television. The noise would irritate me and I couldn't follow anything on the television because the concentration level wasn't there either. Yeah. And um, it was, it was a, you know, lying in the bed on your own when nobody else was around you and you started kind of reflecting on things. I just remember, I just hope I'm there to see my kids grow up. Yeah. And I think, but for the kids, that's the one thing that I think kept me focused and kept me going. It gave me motivation not to give into it because I had a purpose yeah. and a good one. Yeah. But Absolutely. it was very, I mean, you do have moments where it pulls you down and you think, why me and what's going on here? And what's, but you think, well, I thought then there's other people that I've seen in the hospital around me. And as bad as I was, and as although I couldn't concentrate too well, I knew there was ones worse. And that's so why I thought, no, mm. I'm not going to give into this. I'm going to get on with it. So, um, and I had great support from my family, as in my parent, well, my mother and my sister and my husband. Wonderful. But it was very difficult. Yeah. yeah. So how long, Maria, were you actually in hospital for? I was in hospital for the full month of December. Like I said, I started in there on the 3rd of December yeah. and I got out on the 1st of January, in the new wow. year. Properly. And I was tied up to machines constantly when I was in at the very end, like there was tubes everywhere in me. And I remember it, it's one of those things I do remember. I remember at New Year's Eve, um, I was lying in the bed and I asked the nurses, could they not just take me off the machines to start the new year? I didn't want to be on all these machines with all these wires on me for, to, to start in the new year. And they were very, they were very good. Because one other little thing as well was that um, Christmas Eve, again, I want I, now, the nature of my work, December's a very busy month for me. I had all the kids' Christmas presents got and wrapped and bought before all this happened, just to have it out of the way, because I wouldn't have time in December. We're quite busy with work. And it was funny how it all happened, but, but that was all done before any of this happened. Amazing. And I remember asking them, would they let me go home on Christmas Eve to be home for Christmas Day to see the kids? So my husband drove up Christmas Eve night to pick me up and we got me home for the night so that I could see Christmas morning with the kids. And then Christmas Day, they had to drive me back to the hospital again. Aww. But it was an effort. But again, it was just something that kind of just kept me going. It was a magic moment just to kind of be there. Yeah. 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 Because it's just little things, even if it's just a couple of hours, I can imagine it's just, that's just enough to completely lift you up and just feel. But that's, yeah, just the motivation that you've got a purpose, that you're doing something. And like I said, the kids really did help me to kind of get through things because um, they didn't, I mean, they weren't, they knew something wasn't right, but they didn't know what was going on at that age. They, well, you they, know, they, Yeah, I mean, that ties in nicely with just our next question. I was going to ask just about how family members and everybody else dealt with it. I mean, yeah, two children under the age of 10 at that, you know, how, how did they deal? How did they cope? Well, um, at the beginning, you know, we, we didn't want to frighten them. We just said things weren't, I was having a difficult time and that things would be different for them and that they were there to help me. And they were very, very supportive. Yeah. And again, um, again, my fatigue was very, very poor. I couldn't do things very long. My energy level wasn't there. And one way, and I've used it a lot to other people, I explained it as a mobile phone that I needed to be charged. So I used to have what I call resting periods during the day. So every so often I would stop down and call it, and they knew how I had it as class as a resting period. If they could, I was to be left alone. It was just my kind of switch off time for five or 10 minutes and that would recharge me. And that's why I explained it to them that I was a mobile phone and that I just needed charging up for the battery. Otherwise I couldn't keep going. Really, early. And they were, they were very good because the other side of it too was, um, my concentration level wasn't good and I could start a job and get easily distracted and forget about finishing it. Mm -hmm. So they'd be kind of, they were, they were very observant without being too, putting too much on them, but they kind of yeah. knew my routine. They, we, you know, we had a fairly good routine at work and they knew what was the normal pattern. And if there's somebody doing something that I shouldn't be doing or I forgot to do something, mummy, mummy, <laughs> in a nice way. And then yeah. my husband kind of kept, kept tabs on me as well. So, yeah. Um, yeah. and then like my family kind of stayed around and popped in and out. So you know, we they were all very, very supportive, but Absolutely. it was difficult um, because I wasn't able to do the same things that I could do. No. I did have to pace the day a lot more easier. And um, I used the word delegate quite a lot because, you know, if they could pick up something for me, if they could go and do something, even as much as put the kettle on, um, my energy, if it saved me that bit of time and effort, it just didn't take as much out of me. Yeah. So that's yeah. what I think was my biggest word over the beginning was to delegate and ask for help. And it's so good that you did, because I think the problem a lot of us deal with is the, the belief that we can do it all. And so yeah. you kind of like, you then don't ask for the help. And then before you yeah. know it, you, you're just, there's no progress happening. No, you can't, you can't keep going. 
Yeah. And I mean, that's the way, um, again, like I mentioned earlier, we lived out in the country at the time. And also with everything going on, I couldn't drive for a year after coming out of hospital yeah. because during the encephalitis, I had brain seizures. And again, in the rural setting that we were in, the kids used to go to after school activities that were in the swimming club. Everything had you had to drive to get to everywhere. Mm. My husband was working. And the way I looked at it was if the shoe was on the other foot, if I, my neighbor was in the situation, wouldn't I be too glad to help them? And sometimes people want to help you, but they don't know how to help you or what they can do to help you. Yeah. And again, it's not that you're weak, but you don't like asking for help. It's our kind of thing that we can cope. But I kind of put my thinking about, that's the way I thought about it, that if it was my neighbor and they were in that situation, I'd only be too glad to help them. Yeah. And it wouldn't be an effort. So I'm sure others were only glad to help me, but and I had to ask them to tell them what to do. And that's how I coped with that side of it because I, I didn't want my kids missing out on things that I couldn't get them to or collect them from. So, um, and again, I, I, I was very, very lucky that way with everything mm -hmm. really. No, that People were very helpful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I just love the fact that what, how you explained it there, just like, you know, if the shoe was on the other foot, I would want my neighbour to ask me for help. So it allowed you to be able to ask for help. And I just think that's yeah. absolutely brilliant. Yeah, because you don't really like it. So I was just going to ask if you're able to just give us just fast forward a little bit and just give us an idea of the length of time your recovery afterwards. So you've now left hospital. You said you couldn't drive for a year, but what were the challenges that you were specifically, you know, left having to deal with apart from practical things such as not being able to right. drive? Right. Well, um, again, my, my memory was very poor in the sense of, like I say, jobs and things and my timekeeping and appointments and dates. I was very poor at kind of coordinating information of that nature. Mm. Um, you know, whereas before it was something I had no problem with. And what I used to do then was I used to have little notes. The one area that I'd always be at was the kitchen sink, washing, cleaning and doing things that were well, not always, but I would have been. So I had them on the window so that if I had an appointment coming up or I had to take somewhere or the kids had to be somewhere, I had little notes to keep reminding me. Now, people say put it in a book or in a diary, but then I would have forgotten to look in the diary. Or I would, you know, right. <laughs> and then at this point, the mobile phones weren't as technical as what they are now. Yeah. That You yeah. can't have a calendar with a little bleeper on. The other thing that I was very poor with was my sense of direction. As in, um, okay, I was okay around the house, but now coming into the town, if I went up to the shops, if I, you know, I'd be getting lost. Yeah. Even yeah. walking up the street, I'd be thinking, is this the turn? Is that the turn? In the areas that I was, you know, more familiar with, but I, my bearings, my sense of bearings was was very, very poor. Mm -hmm. And um, and that was something now that took a long time to actually fix up. Mm. The other side of it was, like I said, the noise levels. I didn't like anything as a banging or repetitive noise. I couldn't listen to kind of very loud music or a music with a beat, boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Um, the, like, the only music I would put on was something like classic FM, instrumental classical, kind of soothing music. Yeah. Um, and then television was out because I couldn't follow programs. I could watch a documentary or something about wildlife or quizzes maybe. Mm. Um, but when it came down to following a film, I couldn't remember who characters were. I couldn't remember, was that this person, was that them? So we just, I didn't bother watching them in the point. That was something that would just frustrate me for a while. And, and is that still the case now or has it taken a while for no, that to come that's back? that's all improved. Mm. The noise level and like um, the one item now with the noise level was that um, the background music. Another instant where it would hit me more was when we went out for a family day. I couldn't walk into supermarkets or into shops with background music. Mm. because the noise in the shops the, the music would irritate me it would just so so frustrate me so what my daughter obviously she was shopping for clothes and doing things as the girls do she would walk in and pick out places or things that she wanted to show me and then I would stand by the door and when she had them ready to show me she'd have them collected I would step into the shop look at what she wants to show me and then just step out again now that's gone that's improved now that the, to the level where um, and also the fatigue element has gone. Now this took progression. It didn't all happen instantly. Mm. Like I said, this happened in 2007. I would say over two or three years, the noise level started to get better. Um, I suppose I started integrating more and getting out more that I let, took it on more in, in steps rather than jumping into it. Yeah. And um, now it, it doesn't bother me to the point that I'm in a gym and we have blasting music going out and I can hear everything and it doesn't annoy me at all. Um, the other side of it was that the I also lost my sense of taste and smell. Oh, really? So again, working in the industry that I'm in is in the 
restaurant food <laughs> and wine yeah. and the sense yeah. of wine and that it oh, took a, yeah. it took about a back step there as well that was hard too yeah um that was that was very difficult so um but that was one area there, the sense of taste and smell the noise the fatigue and um coordination of information mm. i think they were kind of the main factors that just and the sense of direction that did did have a lot of effects on me so um it was small steps and again a lot of it i hid from people because they weren't aware of it yeah. And you try to cope and it gets to a point at some time you've got to give in and ask for help because you can't do it all. Absolutely. But, um, a lot of it now has has really improved. I'm trying to think here. Now we're 207 to 22. And I would say the majority of those smaller, well, I wouldn't say that there was there were big things at the time. Yeah. But a lot of those things now, um, the taste, a sense of smell would probably still be my weakest. Okay. That I think about. If it's a smell that I like, I can I can get it, but otherwise. And the flavours of food sometimes still would. I like something with a good punch to it rather than being too subtle to get the flavour. Got it. But, yeah. Um, yeah. No, I'm doing okay, I think, and otherwise. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. And then with, because I've, I've met you before, Maria, and we've spoken extensively about the long-term issues that you've been left with. So are you able to explain to our audience the other complications that you've now had to deal yeah. with in life. Well, the major one that I would have now and one that I think is more permanent than anything else is the what we call prosopagnosia, face blindness. Yeah. Um, it was the area of the brain that got damaged. I was fortunate that not a lot of it got damaged, but one area that did um, affect the um, face blindness and my facial recognition of people. So I can meet people and the frustrating part of it is that for some reason I can recognize some people but other times I don't recognize other people and I can't put down um, why I met, you know, why do I recognize one person and not now? Sometimes it's a mannerism or it might be certain characteristic, mm -hmm. but again, there's no pattern to why I know one person and not the other. Yeah. And in the nature of my work, as I say, running a restaurant, um, again, I could have a customer and they come up and ask me for the bill out of away from the table. I don't know what table they've come from. I've got to go and look to see where there's a space on the room, on the chair. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I have staff now that work with me and they kind of very good regular customers that most people book coming in. So my husband who remind me of a connection of who they are. And once I have that, I can remember what they order. I can remember their favorite wines. I can remember their food that they like. It's just that connection of who they are at the beginning just doesn't come ahead. Yeah. Um, but I've, I've worked around it and I'm quite open about it. When people, a lot of the, what I call regular customers, because I say we're here 26 years now. So a lot kind of were aware of the situation and I'm quite open so that they know then, most people know if they see me out of context, tell me who they are when they meet me. Yeah. And they know who I'm talking to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. again, that's kudos to you, I suppose, in the fact that you're willing to be open about your condition and what it's yeah. left you, you know, with so that people understand it. You know, it's not Maria's not being rude. You're not ignoring no. them when you walk past them in the street. That's, you genuinely can't well, recognise them. It was very frustrating at the beginning when, it, you know, when the reality of what was happening did hit. Yeah. And I thought, well, what am I going to do about this? I have two options. One is to go out and put up with it. Or do I just lock myself away and hide from people? Mm. Mm. And, you know, what do you do? I mean, hiding and putting something away isn't the way I wanted to be living. It is annoying to go out and not know. You walk into a room and you've got people around, you don't know who's who. Yeah. Um, and again, some people, and then they look at you and you think, well, there's, with her. there's nothing wrong with her, she looks okay, especially strangers or in a new environment. But, you know, it's, um, if you've got to make the effort, because if, otherwise, what would you do? Yeah. It doesn't help you locking yourself away because it's not doing you any good. No, it doesn't. No. So I suppose that, that leads nicely into, you know, the new Maria as opposed to the old Maria. You've clearly yeah. found some really good coping strategies with what you've been left, you know, the challenges yeah. that you now have. Well, the other side of it too, like I said, my children were growing up and they were involved in different activities. One thing that came from it was um, I, because my fatigue was quite poor, I was um, not able to watch TV I did a lot of reading to pass the time because it was one thing I was able to do yeah. and I could pass, you know, it was a way of passing time. Reading and puzzles were my main two distractions okay. at yeah. the time. Yeah. But what actually happened then was um, in my younger years, I was a keen swimmer myself and the swimmer club that my children were in were looking for supporters because they were getting, you know, they're running down on, on, on the supporters. So I actually then qualified to become a swimming instructor. So I'm a qualified now swimming instructor and also I'm a qualified swimming coach. 
up to a level two on both of them. And all of that was instigated by the encephalitis. Because I had the time, because I wasn't able to work in the restaurant in the same way, I was able to read. Unfortunately, although at reading, I was still able to absorb and remember information. So I was able to pass all the tests, yeah. all the qualifications. And um, you wonder then, how does she cope knowing who's who in the water when she's teaching the kids? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> well, I have a strategy for that as well. Um, again, <laughs> my, my, the supporters of other coaches on poolside, so they're all aware of the situation as well. And we all work with a certain group sometimes. So as they come in, I have the list of who I'm teaching that day. And as they walk in, strike a costume, pink hat. And as their name is there, I'll have a little put something beside them so I can, you know, but like I say, a pink hat, pink goggles, so strike a costume, yeah, spotty costume. Yeah, yeah. I'll put something on that to, so I can link in. But then it gets a bit awkward then when they come out of the changing rooms and they're all dressed. And then who are they now then? Because yeah, yeah. it's a different scenario. <laughs> uh, so I don't get involved in the administration side of anything. I do, the other coaches do that. And if I need help, they know to say this is so-and-so's parent or whatever. And yeah, again, yeah. it's something I've hidden from the kids. A lot of the people aren't aware of my condition. In the, okay. Because the kids, mm. I tend to teach the younger ones because then they're not kind of, they don't switch on us if I keep asking their name all the time. Whereas yeah. if I teach some of the older teenagers, why doesn't she know who I am? She saw me here last week. The younger yeah, ones don't yeah. connect to it in the same yeah, way. So yeah, I've worked yeah. around that pretty well too. Yeah. So I'm, and I'm still I'm still actually doing that now. I'm still a, still working with the swimming club, although my kids have moved on to they're both at university now and everything. I've stayed with the swimming. So that's really good. So again, this is what I've come across speaking to other people who have had encephalitis is it's not all bad news, even though the bad news is awful news. But, yeah. it's, you know, we've been able to turn things around and even learn new skills like you've just yeah. brilliantly shown there. You know, a qualified swimming instructor. Yeah. Who'd have thought that would happen well, as a result? The other of one, another feather to my cap since then, too, was when I did get my driving back. Yeah, I got right now again. My sense of direction was very poor when I got my driving back, and this was before we sat nabs on the car. Mm -hmm. So my kids would be reminding me where to take turns to go here, go there, and if I was taking them to, might like, we used to go to swimming galas in different locations. I'd be going on to Google Maps the night before and looking at as the as the pictures of it and looking for landmarks to know where I got to take a turn. Right. And I, I would forward plan it, but it was a, it was a chore, you know. Yeah. And also, I had to give myself extra extra time because if I did get lost, I had time to find where I was to go back. back. Yeah, yeah. But that again has I wouldn't say it's well, it has got better now. Definitely, that sense of direction and my bearings in different locations has definitely improved. And yeah. um, but what I also did then once I got my driving back was I went and joined the IAM, the Institute of Advanced Motoring, and now I've got a qualification as an advanced driver. No way. So, Amazing. Yeah. So I got that done as well. Yeah. Absolutely. So that was just another, again, it just was <laughs> another feather on the pack, just to say, because I thought I'd have to retake my test after being off for so long, but that wasn't the case. Yeah. And then um, there was a group here in the, in the local vicinity that were doing it. So I thought, well, look, I'll go ahead. And it kind of, I suppose, it adds to my confidence when I get back in the car driving again that I've just got that <laughs> bit more. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, and it's reassurance oh, for everybody. That, yeah. Well, for family as well, that I'm kind of back on track, that I'm not. <laughs> That's it. Because yeah. it's almost like literally like a badge that you need to wear, a badge of honor, just to show, you know, I am okay. And then, you know, I'm not a lost cause and you don't write me off just yet almost yeah, no just that's it you've work. got to kind of fight your corner in a way because Absolutely. you look well and no one sees anything wrong with you but they just yeah. don't realize the problems yeah. and the effort just to be I mean even now at the very very beginning to even hold a conversation for me was such a chore because the concentration that I had to remember what I was saying and I would have been very very repetitive I could have asked my husband a question about what we were going to do today or who was that and within answering the question, within three or four minutes of answering the question, I'd repeat the question as if we'd never had the conversation. Yeah. yeah. Um, so between memory and just coordination of information, it was very, very difficult at the beginning. And it was a chore at times. It was just an effort to hold a conversation. I didn't want the bother of a conversation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but again, with that's all that's all moved on again now, definitely. Brilliant. Yeah. I really identify yeah. with that, actually, Maria, because I know even now when I have certain conversations and it's it's quite a creepy way or not in creepy as in weird creepy but like sneaky in the sense that I'll you know I'll talk to to people and it's just that fear of have I just repeated myself you know have I got their name right you know I'm not entirely yeah. sure so it's always having to almost second guess 
just yeah. a straightforward conversation. And well, I it was that, and then again, with the, at the very, very beginning with my face blindness, people weren't aware of it. And I suppose mm-hmm. I had time to, I had to kind of come to terms with it myself as well. So yeah. at the very beginning, I wasn't really as open as I am now about it. So yeah. I'd go up the street and start talking to somebody. Now, sometimes it would be something that I'd ask a question or they might say something in the conversation and then I'd kind of put two and two together and yeah. I know then who I'm talking to. But yeah. the only thing is that times then, like, you know, when you meet people now, um, again, through time, I might get to know who they are or I can keep an open conversation without asking specific questions so that no one knows I don't know who I'm talking to. Mm. You know, well, are, you, are you off work today? Are you out shopping? You know, you can keep without being too specific. You can hold a conversation. Yeah, yeah. Um. So, it, but again, the frustration is then when you walk away. Who was that person I'm talking to? I don't know. So at times, I just say, "Can you just remind me who you are?" Mm-hmm. Yeah, and if they know me well enough, they know why I'm asking it. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. um, if if I, that's the other side that I would just kind of, and that's what I used to do at the very beginning, just to say, yeah. "Can you just remind me who you are again?" Because holding a conversation without knowing who you're talking to, and it can be kind of awkward in other ways. I mean, I could have had a family member that you know, met someone and her daughter babysat for me. I never asked how the daughter was getting on. You know, things like that. You don't relate yeah. to that person yeah. in the same way. If you course. knew who they were and say, she might have got married the last week, how did the wedding go? You don't ask the specific yeah. questions because you're not really in tune to who you're talking to. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. Your, your level of conversation isn't quite as sharp as it would be if you were in the normal situation. Mm. So it must take an incredible amount of confidence on your behalf to go, to you know to go out and you know like you say out in your in your local village even just knowing that you know there is still the opportunity or chance that you'll meet people where this will happen where you know yeah. a significant event might have happened in their life and you can't recall that event and then for that person to think it oh that's a bit strange you know everyone knew about this why why did why did maria not ask, ask about it yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. again it, it, you could get cut, you could get cut up in it very easily about yeah. kind of how you feel about it and everything but again like i said before what choice then is that do you just lock yourself away or do you interact yeah. and i felt you know i had to do one or the other and that's why i try and be as open as i can about it without now you're not looking for sympathy and you're not no. putting it as a burden on other people. No. Um, my, my way of looking at it is that I'm just raising awareness of encephalitis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not for my own benefit. If I can make people more aware of what encephalitis is, then I'm not just doing it for me, but for other people that are affected because, or other people with a disability that people can't see. I think you learn that, you know, there's other things out there that you just don't, you know, just because they look, you know, as I say, you don't judge a book by its cover. That's right, yeah. And there's a lot yeah. to be said for it. Yeah. And I think, I, I mean, I speak for myself, but I know that many of us feel the same way is it's not almost not until you, you know, contract a condition such as encephalitis, when you just realise just how difficult it is to have something that people can't see. So yeah. therefore, like you say, to present as normal, whatever yeah. that means in the first place yeah. anyway, well, you know, to then yeah. afterwards to then have to feel that you have to explain almost your injury because if we had a broken leg or a broken arm. People would see it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the other side of it, I mean, I'm not knocking the medical profession because they were very, very good to me, but they had like a support nurse that would come out to the house when I got out of hospital to kind of, she wasn't even really fully aware of what my condition was, what was going on, how should I be behaving, what was, you know. They, and the other side of it too was, it wasn't classed as a disability. I was self-employed. Mm-hmm. I got no benefits because I was self-employed. I got no support from sickness or anything. Yeah. So um, financially, there was no support during what, the whole time that we were ill, that I was it ill. It must have been devastating. It was just, yeah, there was nothing. Yeah, yeah. So again, I mean, I, you know, we were fortunate in one way, but at the same time, it, it can, and it is a burden, it's a worry to think that, you know, because... Yeah. At the point of time when it was all happening, we didn't know my, what my recovery was going to be like. Was I going to be left that way? Was I going to be Bless able you. to return to work? Exactly. And it, it was a worry because we were self-employed, running our own business. Mm. Now, our support network of staff were absolutely superb, as were, I mentioned, the babysitters over the time that it happened. A lot of them had gone away, maybe even old babysitters that were still in it when they found out, come out to help and assist. Lovely. Again, the people were very, very supportive. And again, we took the help. Yeah, you know yeah. that was the other side of it that I, I learned that you just don't don't knock it back. You know, mm. as proud as you want to be, mm-hmm. and and whatever, but you know, you've got to kind of be sensible, and it's not always easy to be sensible. But I think that was the way I looked at it—that you just had to take the help, and it was there. Definitely. But um, that was another kind of 
worry put on us at the time was, was I going to be able to get back to work being self-employed and the nature of our work, what was going to be happening? Because up until that point, my husband kind of carried it all the way through with the staff. And December was, you know, with everything else going on, it was a big, big worry. But I think keeping him occupied was a help for him, really. Another way. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, because it just, that's now his focus. So, he, yeah. you know, just, yeah, carry he on. He was there for me, but I think he just needed something more. Because, again, he didn't know what was happening. He saw changes on me that he just never thought would ever happen. Yeah. I mean, there was one incident now, just kind of a funny one I mentioned earlier on about my sense of taste and smell and everything. And, again, there's, I was like, you know, before all this happened, there was foods I liked, there was foods I didn't like, there was things I would eat, there was things I would never even dream of touching. Yeah. Well, my mother saw me eating food that she never thought she'd see me eat because, again, <laughs> I was so bad. I just you, know, you just I would just eat anything in front of me because I didn't know what I was eating I couldn't taste it and she was saying to me in the hospital when I was there Marie you wouldn't normally eat that was that okay for you do you want me to go and get you something else I didn't care it made no difference to me because <laughs> I couldn't taste it and that's it so yeah but that was the yeah. one thing I think that they found quite um we, we did laugh about it was like exactly. I was eating yeah. things I would never have eaten before yeah yeah I can't say that the good things or the bad things but just yeah but um, and again, I can relate to it. You're just, but you don't enjoy food because you just don't taste it. Well, that's. But the that way you look at it is, you need yeah. it. Yeah, you need. No, it's got better. That has improved yeah. a lot over the time. Okay. But again, that's something that was kind of a. It was a chore again to eat, and then you knew you had to eat to keep going. But at the same time, you've got no enjoyment and no satisfaction. Mm. So mm. it was put in front of you. You just did it and moved on. Mm. Just mm. yeah. So that was. Um, that was the other one as well, the food element. Oh. So Marie, you yeah. were talking earlier about awareness or you, you know, you're you're trying to push awareness of encephalitis out. Yeah. There. And I guess that's twofold coming from not having awareness of encephalitis at the point of when you were diagnosed with yeah. it. So do you want to just tie in a bit about the awareness and what you do with regards to the encephalitis society? And how yeah, you well, initially. Awareness? Uh, my introduction to the encephalitis society was once things started to get more coherent with me and I was able to kind of do things more myself and get more independence I started reading more about like I said reading was one thing I could do and the encephalitis then I found the society on just the internet really and they were a lifeline mm. not just for me and my husband but my mother further afield and my sister although they weren't at hand they were keeping tabs on things and they were on the phone checking and asking things so getting that to them as well and getting an understanding from their perspective of what they could do, what maybe was the things, the progression, how things might move and whatever. It was a great facility for all of us and we all used it as a family network. And it kept me any questions I had or if I just needed someone to talk to that I didn't. I think the other thing sometimes was I might have had a problem, but I didn't want to share the problem with other members of the family because I felt I was putting too much on them already. And I didn't want them worrying more about me because I've got this problem when they've enough to cope with. Yeah, yeah. So um, not that, you know, so I'm not saying I had a lot of big problems, but it could have just been something silly at the time, but it meant, you know, it was hurting me maybe. And I might have picked up the phone and spoke to somebody at the society. They talked me through it. They gave me a way of coping with it or they gave me, you know, some way of dealing with it or, or even sometimes just talking and getting it out to somebody. That's made it better you need, but yeah, without yeah. like I say whereas again that my family were great but I felt I was putting them through enough that I didn't want to be adding more to them mm -hmm. so the society was really good in that point of, of, of help as well or um and then when things got better and I got more confident again I thought I want to do something for the society and that's when I volunteered then to become a supporter for them now here in Northern Ireland at the time I didn't meet anybody else with encephalitis. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, you know, we, nobody kind of knew anybody, even at the hospital and everything. Nothing seemed to be registering with it at all for anybody. There was no one saying, oh, I knew somebody with that or I had to come across, you know, and the community that we're in it is quite community orientated. You kind of do get a lot of feedback. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I thought, well, I'll do something here then that I can do as best I can. Mm. So that was back then, probably in, oh, I would say maybe end of 08, 09, probably I started with the society. Right. did all their training courses and did everything like that and main, mainly again just to give them the support and to help raise, raise awareness of the society and over the time then I've done different fundraising for them and I've also attended different conferences that they've had and I've also been involved in a number of research brain research facilities 
as far away as Australia. Wow. Um, a lot of it is over, again, it's mainly more now to do with the prosopagnosia and the face blindness. Right, yes. Um, I've done a lot of the universities are doing research on this and um, they might give me, a lot of it is memory problems, memory things and photographs that they can, you can do it on a computer. Mm. They can just give me a link to do it and then I just follow it through. Fantastic, yeah. So um, I've done about four or five, I've done Australia and Manchester, Oxford, I've done quite a number of, of research or connections for that there too. But again, if it helps them to forget a better understanding of the condition and if they can find ways of helping people, um, you know, I can relate to this. I mean, one other little thing really now just coming to mind, I have a lady coming into the swimming club at the minute and we're teaching a child that's actually blind. But her mother is very techn technology orientated and she was yeah. telling me because of my, my face blindness that there's a camera now that could record who I'm meeting when I meet them. And then you can have an earpiece that would actually tell you then when they, it triggers their facial recognition on the screen to tell you then who they are. But no, I haven't gone down that road. Wow. But again, it's, yeah, because her daughter's blind, yeah. she's probably more tuned in to other things. And I'm not technically blind in the same way, but the facial recognition is something... Yeah. Yeah. So she's obviously aware of this tool that can help people if they've got, you know, it's like a little camera. You, I don't know how it works, but she said mm -hmm. it, it helps you to get through to facial recognition that you know who you're talking to when, you, when you're talking to them. See, this, so there's the yeah, technologies yeah. out there. There's so yeah. much more facilities out there. Um, yeah. I guess one thing it's like the mobile phone is keeping up to date with it and finding out, but it's not one that I've actually looked down at at the minute. But mm -hmm. if I felt I was getting worse, mm -hmm. and my memory was getting worse, maybe that's something that I or it was getting to me more that I had to kind of look into it. Yeah. I know there's something else that I can look at, yeah. and um, it's something that I've kind of left alone at the minute. But yeah, I know it's there in the corner if I need it. Yeah, and yeah. it's brilliant that that type of technology is out there now. Yeah, and to help just make things easier for. Well, everything, yeah. Oh, like I said, like the sat nav on the, on the on the on the on the phone on the phone and on the car, like now is yeah. such a, a, a saver for me compared to the way it was at the very beginning when I went back. So, yeah. um, yeah. it's knowing how to use the technology and having the patience yeah. to to learn how to use it. Sometimes that's that's the that's other side of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or like yeah. you say, trying to find the technology, because it's true, you know, like you say, with the whole writing list, like, oh, why not just put it in a book? It's like, I'd forget to, you know, to find yes. the book. And it's, yeah, yeah you just need yeah. to. So you've got to find a system that will work for you within your own environment. That's it. It's about. Yeah. And, and, and I think the biggest thing is admitting what you've got as a problem and admitting it to yourself, because sometimes you just try and put it off thinking, you ignore it and try and think it'll go away, but if yeah. you kind of acknowledge it and make a, you know, address it as a problem and think, well, what way, you know, look at your options. And yeah. I suppose yeah. I'm lucky in one way that I'm quite, I wouldn't say focused, but I'm determined. Mm -hmm. I don't give in very easily and I, I don't give up. I think, you know, I think you see that there is hope at the end of the chat, you know, if you can kind of keep looking ahead yeah. and thinking, well, you know, if you don't give it a try, how are you going to know? Yeah, and absolutely. then you can look back and say, "Well, at least I tried. At least I gave it my shot." Whereas thinking, doing nothing, or I should have. Why didn't I do that when I had the opportunity? Yeah. I missed that now, and that's too late. So yeah. I think you've got to kind of go for it when you can. Yeah. Wonderful, Maria. So on that note, then, if somebody came to you that had been diagnosed, you know, newly diagnosed with encephalitis, what words of encouragement could you like, you know, give to them? I think words of encouragement. I would say is to try and stay positive. Yeah. as best as you can I mean and the other way that I looked at it is that we all have good days and we all have bad days and one way I often kind of look at it is that when I feel I'm having a bad day and I'm going down I call a hole yeah. so the deeper I go down that hole the harder it is for me to get out of the hole mm. so if I know I'm going down I try and get something to do get yourself occupied go and talk to somebody go and get something to do don't go any deeper because the deeper you go, the harder it is to get out. Recognize when you're having one of those moments and then keep yourself away from those moments as best you can by keeping yourself distracted. Or finding something, like I said earlier, it was my kids that kept me focused to give me drive to be there for them and to help them. So you find something that kind of gives you a bit of a spur that will help you kind of get through things. And nothing big, just give yourself targets that you know you've got are achievable without setting it too high a target that you've defeated yourself before you've even started. Right. 
Yeah. And then acknowledge it when you do something that you've done that you haven't done before, that you feel you're getting better. Give yourself a little treat or reward or even a pat on the back and get somebody to say it to you from the family member. I wasn't doing this last week. And look, now I can do this. That's such a because it's only a small little thing. But when you start the way you at the, at the beginning and think I couldn't do it and now you're doing it. It's, yeah. Like yeah. I said, walking up the street for me was an effort. Yeah. That's just, just the fatigue yeah. was just so hard. And last year for World Encephalitis, I did a 22 kilometer run. <gasps> did you really? Wow. Well, I did a I did a run and, and I did a combination of run and, and rowing because we had snow at the time. So I did a combination. But my energy level is completely the fatigue and that side of it now has, has really gone and gone completely. Um again, I can go to a gym and do workouts now for an hour. I can swim back the way I was. So the energy level and the fatigue has has, has gone by completely. Now, one other thing, just talking about all that, and I haven't really mentioned it at all, was my sleep was badly disrupted. Oh, my sleeping okay. pattern has gone completely. Um, I would only know on average, I would only sleep maybe three or four hours a night. Sorry, I just need to charge. Okay. Sorry to interrupt yep. you. Can you just start that again? Because I just yep. got to edit this bit out. Okay. One, one area that I just thought about that I haven't brought up before is after the encephalitis, um, my sleeping pattern was disrupted quite badly. Right. And in in, when I say disrupted, I sleep. The only major thing is that I don't sleep for very long. Right. Okay. So um, on average now, my sleep would be to be around about four hours a night. That's quite heavily. Four, busy, yeah. Isn't it? If I go, yeah. I mean, with the nature of my work, 10, 11 o'clock, I'm not in bed much before 11. I'm usually awake between three and four in the morning. Wow. And I mean, I'm awake, awake that I'm not just waiting, you know, so um, again, now at the beginning, when I first had the encephalitis, I was doing the qualifications for the swimming. Yeah. So I got up and I used to look at videos to watch techniques on what they were doing, how things were being done on YouTube, or I might have um, read the books and things and that so and do puzzles. Um, and again, it's the time of the night that you can't do very much around the house because you don't want to wake everybody else up. Sure. sure. So um, I've, I've, I've come to terms with it in other ways, but usually I would very rarely sleep past four or five in the morning. Um, there's a facility here that I can go to at six o'clock in the morning. I'm usually there every morning at six o'clock, yeah. getting out to do something because it just gives me something to do. Yeah. yeah. Um, and again, I did go and talk to my doctor about this because again, you read so much how you need about eight hours sleep or whatever yeah, on average. Yeah. So, um, but the nature of my work, I'm in front of people quite a lot. Um, am I rude to them? Have I got short temper? Am I abrupt? He was just asking me what were my mannerisms with, you know, was I feeling, and that doesn't, that was okay. My concentration, I wasn't forgetful. I wasn't having problems within reason of encephalitis, yeah. but you know, I wasn't being forgetful in that there. So when it wasn't disturbing and showing everyday factors, like I'd asked family members to be aware of things if they noticed it. So um, I can, it seems I can cope. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, it's just one of those things. So I don't need a lot of sleep, wow. but that would have been more so now since the encephalitis. That's but when I am sleeping now, I hear nothing. Really? So it, it is a really deep sleep. I go into a very, very deep sleep. I yeah. hear, I mean, I hear nothing, nothing now. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's the, I think it's the quality of my sleep rather than the quantity. Yeah, that's what I put it down to. I mean, I don't have to set a clock to go anywhere because I'm never, you know. But if I get the chance of sleeping on, I'll take it because I don't get it very often. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, so the sleep was a, is another thing that, um, you know, again, there's times that I always find between three and four in the afternoon would be a time that kind of it hits me. Mm. Um, so again, mm. I would try and sit down and maybe just again not do very much but just give myself time to stop for a little while because yeah. again I have long days with the nature of my work I'm working till 10 or 11 at night imagine yeah and so, so yes. find it hits me more during the day than when I'm doing nothing yeah. sitting in a car as a passenger that's the one time I might just doze and have 40 winks okay yeah not very often but that's about the only time <laughs> oh, yeah yeah so I know we, were, we spoke about music briefly earlier and you mentioned yeah. that incredibly yeah at the beginning you really were averse to music and couldn't even yeah. listen to it in you know in stores or out in public I mean how how is it now do you, is music you know do you use music as a form of therapy or is it more I would no, I like yeah I do like to listen to music 
Um, yeah. Even now, what I would do now, um, if I'm up, is uh, going to bed at night time, I have a radio beside the bed, mm. and um, I would put something on now. And it isn't just instrumental music now; it might be something magic. It's one of the channels I listen to, no. um, Heart UK, go different music channels on. Yeah, but I, I would put it on one of those sleepers that it might play for 15, 20 minutes prior, as I go to sleep. Yeah. And I actually find it helps me switch off and just slow down a bit. Oh, okay. So now I would listen to music that way, and again. Um, with the nature of the work, I've background music within the room yeah, at times, so and that doesn't annoy me now either. Yeah. And like I said, I go to a gym facility and we use music for workouts. Mm -hmm. And again, I've coped with that as well. So the music side hasn't um, has really improved. Yeah. And I think there's, I mean, you do touch on songs and things like that there, but I think the one that kind of I would kind of relate to a lot more now is a bridge over troubled water, oh. Simon and Garfunkel. Wonderful. Okay, that's the one again. At the time, you know, when I could get back into music, I couldn't get the bump, bump, bump. So I was kind of listening to kind of semi-classical, yeah. something quite easy listening. And I think the words kind of would click into me as well. So um, that's one that I would kind of listen to every now and again. Or when I do hear it play, it kind of triggers triggers memories in, it in a positive way. Yes, yes. Um, but I think, you, you know, I think you've got to kind of look forward and think, you know, you, if you... You know, if you give in, no one's going to pull you out. You've got to kind of help mm -hmm. and take the help and support that's there for you. If someone's around and offering you assistance, you know, make use of it. Yeah. Because they're only there to give you help. And if you try and do it all on your own, you really are giving yourself something, you know, making it a lot, lot harder. Yeah, yeah. I think you've got to kind of take what's available as best you can. Outlook. I think your outlook has just been amazing because you're clearly, like you say, very determined, but very resilient, but also very open to the help and aware, you know, when there's limitations, take that help, you know, yeah. don't deny it. And I think that's such an amazing quality because most people, if you're, it, it might be a typical stereotype, I don't know, but, you know, when you think of people that are determined and resilient, sometimes you think that they're also a bit kind of like, um, one mindedness and it's kind of like no 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 it's my way I've got it sorted maybe I'm speaking more for myself I yeah. don't know but um, you seem incredibly willing to take the help which I just yeah. think is fantastic and necessary but, see the other side of it too was when I was before in encephalitis if I wanted a job done the right way I'd have done the job myself yeah yeah okay because nobody else could do the way I wanted it done again yeah. you know not that I'm a perfectionist but I like things done a certain way and I <laughs> yeah. yeah but again like I said that was the other word I learned was delegate because again I got to the point where I couldn't cope with some jobs that was out of my reach I didn't have the energy level to do them yeah. and if I had to teach someone something new or get them guidance and whatever um or you just compromise and just that we'll be grateful that you've got the help that they're doing something rather than you know so um, you, you do look at things, you've got to try and reevaluate re and look at the look at it from a bigger picture mm -hmm. and just try and see how, how um, you know, you, you can cope, but it's not easy. No. You've got there's a lot of compromise and yeah. there's a lot of frustration yeah. and a lot of patience. I think that's the other side of it. When you said if somebody was coming through, just finding it, give yourself time. I think time is the best healer of all. And also don't, you know. Try and find a positive rather than a negative to look at. And if you find something's not right, then, you know, see is there a way around coping with it that, you know, you've got some other alternative or can you gain something by doing something differently? Yeah, yeah. And the other side of it is that I feel by being so open about it, I'm giving hope to people that have come through or going through it now. Yeah. And not only in encephalitis, but anybody that's got now, again, I know we're talking about encephalitis, but mm -hmm. since that, I've also had another condition. Um, I had cancer. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, being open about things and, and, and getting on, you, you just, I think you, people are there to help you. But yeah. like I said before, they don't know what to do to help you. Yeah. 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 If you can give them guidance and ask them how to help you and tell them how to help you, you're giving them, they, they feel good about doing it because they're doing something they, they, they know they want to do, but they just didn't know how to do. And it's making it easier for you. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Marie, incredible, incredible. You are a woman of strength for sure. And I bow down to you. Well, I think that's also back to the family. My kids, even now, are still very, very supportive. Brilliant. Um, and I think they've grown up with the understanding of a disability. Yes. And, yes. you know, awareness of people with, I mean, I've seen it in other scenarios with them now as well. And I think people just are, 
Well, again, it's just raising awareness. I think that's the biggest thing is the word awareness that, you know, get people to be more compassionate and understanding and patient when you've got somebody in front of you. Just don't assume they look OK, that everything is OK. So I think that's the other side of it. And the Kevin Lighter Society, I think, has achieved a lot since I've been with them. Yeah. And it's grown so much since I've been with them. And over COVID now, we've done a lot. We, we, but the, being a volunteer, we would have a meeting once a year for people here in Northern Ireland affected with encephalitis. And again, with COVID, that had to stop because of the meetings. Yeah. So what actually came about in a more positive manner from the COVID was our Zoom meetings. Absolutely. Whereas we'd only had a meeting once a year together, we're now doing once a month by the machines yeah yeah so they've served their purpose well getting to know technology and working yeah. out how they work <laughs> but it's given us another connection and the other side of it now i mean it's a sad reflection really but i don't like to see the numbers growing here in northern ireland but i'm meeting more and more people mm. affected by encephalitis mm. and it's not a number you like to see like say going up no but no. It, it, i don't know is it being that people are getting diagnosed quicker that there's more awareness coming through from it or whatever but uh, you know I think at least we have a network here for them now that if they want help yeah. when I first had it here I didn't know anybody here we've now got a little group that you can relate to people with the same issues but you're not trying to explain everything in the same way to someone that doesn't understand so um, like I said we meet at least once a month and we're now hoping to plan a face-to-face -face meeting in the very near future wow. now that COVID hopefully is moving moving on as well yeah. so um that's one of the other roles here and again seeing other people come through it and get through it helps me kind of well it, it, it makes me feel good being a volunteer to see that that we've done something to make life easier not only for the person but for the people around them as well yeah and again just speaking up today doing this we're putting it out there we're wanting to raise awareness for for world yeah. encounter writers day the 22nd of february and yeah. that's what this is all about isn't it it's just it is, yeah it's, we want people to be aware yeah. of encephalitis, to know of it, to recognise the symptoms, to when they're being diagnosed, to not have to say, what is that, you know, yeah. to at least, or at least if they don't know what it is. It's have it in the equation quicker. Yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly yeah. that, exactly that. Yeah. So Maria, we're nearing the end, but I just wanted to kind of like put the floor to you and just say is there anything that you wanted to say anything that I've not asked you you know just any final thoughts that you'd like to share with our audience oh I think we've shared most of what I can think of here <laughs> now. I don't think there's much more I can say um I think the other one I think you've got to do is acknowledge the support that you have around you in the sense of family members or good friends there um, it's, it's hard for you, but for people that have seen the changes on you and how you've had to cope and what you're going through, it's very hard for them as well. Mm. And I think you've got to remind them to look after themselves, because if they don't look after themselves, they can't look after you. Very true. So um, there's, there's, there's a whole scenario out there, but it's taken it step by step. Yeah. And just like I say, I think I've covered all the other topics that we can kind of relate to asking for help and you know, it's um, it's a lonely road at times, mm -hmm. but again, don't feel that you're on your own. When you feel you're having those moments, make connections with either the society or some family member that you can relate to or a friend. Yeah. Don't let yourself get down on it because it's not going to help you. Yeah, I think you know, and don't give into encephalitis. It will no. make you stronger. You've got to look for it yeah. on the positive, though. Don't let it get the better of you, because oh, no. you know, you know, life's for living. 100%. And that's the way I look at it. I've got the opportunity to live now. I'm going to make the most of it. Yeah, that's it, Maria. Well, I lay in a bed long enough thinking, am I ever going to come out of it? Yeah. I didn't know, you know, I really, really thought I'm never going to get through this. What's going to happen? Yeah. Now that I've got the opportunity to live, like I say, I don't waste much of it. I do as much as I can when I can. And I think, well, I'm not getting any younger, but when I get to a point where I'm going to be sitting in a chair, I can look back and say, I did it when I could. I made the most of what I had, so that's the way I look at it now. Yeah. I think every day is a bonus. You don't take the next one for granted. Because that's the way encephalitis came. It just came out of the blue. Doesn't it just? So think, yeah, it's and it, it kind of wakes you up because we had plans that when the kids were, we got grew up that we would go and do holidays, me and my husband on our own, because we didn't want to take the kids. We would do it ourselves. Well, after that then, 
we stopped that and we've taken the kids now we went to china with the kids wow. that was a destination we wanted to go to we thought we'll wait till they grow up and do it ourselves but once my recovery through encephalitis came about we did it ourselves with the kids amazing <laughs> yep oh no we've done quite a number of holidays that's so. living life right there well that's, that's it that's, yeah. yeah that's the yeah. whole thing that you know you think you do it later on when they're not very whatever but you don't know what's ahead that's just it Why so when you've got an intention of making a plan and you've got a dream live the dream as best you can when you can mm. and then when that one's gone there'll be another one there for you <laughs> <laughs> oh Maria, I love it. Thank you so, so, All right. so much for what you know what we've been speaking about today. I honestly yeah. I love your just your outlook and it's been fantastic hearing your story and sharing your experience. Yeah. I'm sure our audience will agree that you know it's it's an yeah. incredible story, yours is really well, is. Well, yeah, I think anyone that's come through encephalitis, I mean, unfortunately, like I said, I'm more one of the positive scenarios of coming through it. And I value that because working with the society, I've seen and met other people that haven't been so fortunate. Exactly. So I think that's why I try and make the most of it and try and get people to think positively because at the beginning when it all happened, like there was so much going wrong with me, I thought I was never going to be right. Everything was wrong. To see where I've come from and where I am now, then I think, you know, I'll say don't give in and always hope and, and plan forward. Yeah. I think that would be the thing. So we'll give it a, yeah. And we'll see what the next adventure is going to be now. I've nothing planned for a little while. COVID has, COVID has curbed everything for a while. Yeah. Well, we'll keep in touch and we'll see. There'll be, yeah. maybe there'll be a part two. We can come back to you again. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see how that goes. Yeah. I really appreciate right. it today. You take yeah. care. All the best. Okay, then we'll see you soon. Speak again. Okay, thanks. You have been listening to The Day My Brain Broke. If you would like further information about the Encephalitis Society, their website is encephalitis.info. That's E-N-C-E-P-H-A-L-I-T-I-S dot info. You can also find them on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and LinkedIn. Also, if you have been or know of someone else who has been affected by encephalitis and you would like to share your story, please do get in contact with us as we would love to hear from you. You can email me at lucy.teamencephalitis at gmail.com. And finally, if you're also inclined to see more of what I have to offer, then please do like and subscribe to my YouTube channel, Ladybird Wellness. You can also find Ladybird Wellness on Facebook and Instagram.